All right, let's open up in prayer. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to study your word. And as we do so, we ask that we implement that word by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can become more like Christ in our thinking and our seeing and our behavior. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 11. We're just going to briefly review that, and then we're going to move on. Okay, so I want to get something perfectly clear this morning. If I say somebody read that, it's always with the following parenthesized out loud word. Okay, so if I say somebody read that, then it's always to be assumed you read it out loud so we all can hear it. All right. <laughs> okay, now that we've got the preliminaries behind us, somebody read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you. So that your daily life may win the respect of the outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Okay, so there's a list of things that the Apostle Paul is instructing the Christians at Thessalonica to do. One, he says, mind your own business. Basically, just be, it, be responsible for your relationship with God, and let the other person be responsible for their relationship with God. I think that's pretty good advice. Um, a lot of times we're more focused on what someone else is doing and we forget what we're doing. Um, and so he's just simply saying, mind your own business. Then the next thing he says, um, well, first of all, leave a quiet life. You don't need drama. It's not necessary. Anybody like drama? I, I saw Sherry. She's like, oh, drama. <laughs> we, could do, we could do without the drama, right? Yeah. It's, not, it's not necessary. For some people it is. Though. Well, they find that, yeah, they like the drama. That's sure. they're used to. Yeah. We call, what do we call drama, drama queens. queens and kings and yeah, things drama like that? Queens. Yeah, it's just but. You see, drama is the way people in the world get attention. All right? They, they want to be noticed. They want to be the life of the party, so to speak. Okay? So there's always this fog that surrounds them, so to speak. And it's not really necessary in the kingdom of God. All right? I mean, we're all loved by God. And if we're working on a relationship with Him, He's improving us. And at the same time, if... Others are working on their relationship with God. He's improving them. And then we come together, and we don't, we don't need the drama. Yeah, we get used to the drama in the world because that's what the world is all about. There's no real substance, there, so they have to you know, eat, drink, and be merry because um, there's no hope. There's no hope. I remember years ago, I used to go to some parties, and it was... Everybody was drinking, and they had their can of beer in their, they had their shots or whatever, and everybody, oh, this is a great time. And you couldn't even hear what the other person was saying, hardly. The music was loud, people were tripping over each other, you know. They, I didn't say I was drunk, but now that you mention it, okay. But, I mean, you know, and, they, and then they, then they, um, they end up the next day about noon and says, oh, man, last night was a great time. I don't even remember what I did, but it was Exactly. Good. <laughs> it's like, I feel Sound like. familiar? <laughs> yes, mommy. <laughs> it's like. Reminders, <laughs> reminders not needed. <laughs> and so in, in the church, it's not. Look, okay, we've got a lot to live for. We can be happy without getting drunk. And then remember. Except if we're drunk on the spirit. Now that's something different. Yeah. Okay. 
That's how I wear them. The, o- the only thing we need to drink that's not created is the living water because he's the creator. So those, those are the things that we need to focus on. So live a quiet life. Mind your own business. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't mince too many words here, does he? Nope. And this is a pretty good um, solution or a list to follow and to live by. Then he says, to work with your hands just as we told you. Now, I want to bring this into context, to work with your hands here. Here's what was going on. In the early days, right after Christ had been crucified, and he was buried and he was resurrected, um, basically, he said, I'm coming back. And a lot of the early churches expected it to be immediate, and it was immediate. In other words, he said immediately, basically. There's a sense of urgency. There's a sense of immediacy in, in the sense of he's coming back. I would be happy, and so would you too, if he came back before we got finished this morning. All right? And we're to have, as Christians, we're to have this, this concept that Christ could return any moment. Well, back in the beginning, especially with these churches, the Thessalonican church, people were looking for him to come back immediately, so they were sitting around waiting. They weren't working. They just, hey, why should I work, you know? Jesus is coming back. (laughs) I think some of us have got that idea still. (laughs) Why should I work? Jesus is coming back. And so what was happening, they weren't working, and if they're not working, well, they're not providing. If they're not providing, well, then that becomes really a bad um, uh, really a bad um, well, bad scenario, but also it was just a bad scene in that sense. Well, here's these Christians. <coughs> you can imagine what was going on with the non-Christians. Well, here's these Christians. They're just sitting around waiting for Jesus to come back. They're not being responsible. They're not working. They're not taking care of their families, etc. And so he wanted to correct this attitude. Yeah, we're supposed to expect Jesus to come back immediately, but in the meantime, we're to be working. Not only are we to be providing for our families and for those that can't take care of themselves, but we're also be working for him sharing the gospel in a very loving and compassionate way, sowing the seed, all right, giving people the opportunity to have another choice, introducing them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there's two ways of looking at this. Number one, these individuals weren't necessarily being irresponsible. They were just really saying, okay, Jesus is coming. I don't need to do anything. Hope he gets here by noon, okay, type stuff. But at the same point in time, other people were looking at that as being slothful, irresponsible. And so the Apostle Paul simply says, go to work. Get a job. Kind of cuts into the witness a little bit. Cuts into the witness. (laughs) So the witness basically then is you're supposed to be responsible physically while here on earth and spiritually while here on earth but yet I can sit around waiting for Jesus so you think that kind of takes the edge off of my witness anybody believe that have you know anybody just waiting around for Christ just kind of hanging low okay well I'm not going to get me a job well like me I don't work so but you've worked (laughs) you still work you know, I'm sure you, you work as hard as some of us. I'm sure. And so that was, his, that was his challenge. Now, I mean, the motivation for that is found in verse 12, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. Win. Earn it. That you may earn it. You just, you just can't go out there and demand respect. Oh, you can, but it doesn't work. I've tried it. Maybe you too have. The fact is, it's where to set the example, where to be Christ-like, loving, uh, no need for the thrill, living a quiet life, not stirring up the hornet's nest, minding our own business, working hard, even though we know that 
you know, I would never be disappointed if I worked all week long, Debbie, and then all of a sudden, just before I got ready to go in and pick up my paycheck, Jesus took me home. I would not disappoint me at all. That'd be the best paycheck. Yeah. And, you know, Lord forbid that we just go out and stack up the bills thinking, okay, well, before I have to pay him, the Lord's going to take me home. You know what? People probably do think that. <laughs> well, if I can think about it, I know others have. Maybe they participate in that. I don't know. Man, you guys look great on that house boat. Oh, you saw that? Oh, I saw that. <laughs> I saw. Anytime you need somebody to type, test out the houseboat, I've got some people in mind. <laughs> you look, look at, they were minding their own business. They were living a quiet life, and they are waiting expectantly for the Lord to return. Yep. Thank you. And then I jumped. Then you jumped in the lake. <laughs> what lake was that? Chatfield. Oh, was that Chatfield? You did? It didn't work? <laughs> I didn't have a life vest on. <laughs> oh. Oh. My faith is such that if I can't walk on water, I'll just hit bottom and walk out. <laughs> uh. Now, the next section of this is entitled in the NIV, The Coming of the Lord. It's verses 13 through 18. And before we get into this, Paul's approach to this portion of Scripture and to his witness to the Thessalonians is not so much to be a theologian concerning eschatology at this point in time. Eschatology is the study of end times. His endeavor and his sharing with those at Thessalonica at this particular point in time was not to become this great theologian and to explain away everything there is to know about the second coming of the Lord, the rapture, when it's going to happen, the sequencing of the various things that will happen, or that is the order, the time, etc. His entire purpose for sharing this was to be pastoral, that is to comfort, to comfort these individuals. He was not trying to be a theologian. Now, if you want to try to be a theologian, I'll challenge you to come and just witness our class from 4 to 7 on Thursdays called the Credentials Class. That's where we're trying to be theologians. That's when we get in there and we kind of dissect everything and we pull it apart and we see if what we're thinking is consistent with the entire word of God, not with just a scripture. Um, but here, Paul was trying to be a pastor and comfort the hearts of his readers. And in doing so, he can comfort our heart too in the same exact way. So, if I can, let me have somebody read... Um, verse 13 through uh, 13 and 14. Brothers, uh, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of you who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And so he's starting to talk about things are to come and he wanted to make sure that they were reassured I guess in what they had been taught and what they had been what they had heard and basically in the, I think in the King James it says but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope first of all as Christians we have hope don't we our hope is basically predicated on the historical example of Jesus Christ and also the acceptance of Jesus as being the Son of God as well as the Messiah in the sense that he satisfied the righteous requirements of the Holy God. He was killed, basically murdered. He was buried and God because and God raised him from the dead and therefore we know that Jesus Christ is the first fruits of them that sleep or slept. We know that he's the first one that has overcome sin and death. 
and God honored him and raised him because he, he satisfied the righteous requirements of God. And we also know that today he uh, sits at the right-hand side of the Father interceding for Christians. He doesn't intercede for non-Christians. So we just basically cut his load, well, way more than in half. Okay. He's up there interceding for those that have accepted him as their personal Lord and Savior. Um, and so here the Apostle Paul is going to talk about those that sleep. And that's just a, what is it, euphemism or whatever, is that what it's called? Sleep is basically a different word for death. Now, I personally believe that there's a reason that individuals use the word sleep. But we're not going to get into that today. All right? I don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. First of all, if you've lost a loved one and they're a Christian, God's got it. He's got it under control. Okay? We don't have to we don't have to weep, we don't have to grieve for them. Although we do grieve humanly, humanistically, excuse me, in that sense. Because we miss them, right? I mean, good Lord, we got people grieving. I mean, how, how long? Do you, how, okay, so is there a legalistic way to grieve? No, it's individual. <laughs> it's individual. I've been doing it for 15 years. Okay, so you're really providing hope to others right now, aren't you? <laughs> it's hard, though. It's hard, sure. I wonder what he would have been like today. I picture him, you know, everybody says they're good memories, but they're the memories of so. Yeah. But it gets less. I do my reading, but it's not every day. But there's times it hits me, and I, and, but I know he's with the Lord. Okay. And that comforts me, you know, because that was his. So you, you said something that was really important because you said something exactly what the Thessalonican people were concerned with. I mean, I'm thinking about what if they were alive today. All right. I mean, uh, they're no longer with us, they're sleeping. Okay, basically dead and um, and so the first thing the apostle Paul says look at we've got a hope those that don't have Jesus they have no hope they have no hope so that's the first thing he says then the next thing he says according to the Lord's own words we tell you that we who are still alive who are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep that is they're going to be right there with us. Right. That's your own All right? So when the rapture happens, we're not going to precede them, but they're going to be right there with us. In fact, he finally says, okay, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Now, here's what's, what's going on. There's a lot of philosophy that's even out there this day and age discussing, you know, where are the dead, etc. Uh, there was knowledge that they already had received that basically when the Lord comes back, we're going to go to meet him in the air. So their concern was with their loved ones. Well, what is happening to these individuals that have already died? I mean, they were concerned with them. I mean, what's going on with them? If we're going to meet with the Lord, what's happening with them? And without getting into a large theological discussion on death and the soul and mortality and immortality and corruption and incorrupt, uh, uncorruptible and corruption and so forth, the Apostle Paul simply acts as a pastor to say, don't worry about them because when the Lord comes back, when in the rapture, we call that the rapture, okay, when he comes back in the clouds, those who are um, asleep in Christ will what? Will rise, first. will rise first. And then we'll meet the Lord in the air and we'll go to be with him. So he was trying to comfort people. Now there's a lot of different philosophies that were going on back then just as they are today in reference to that. So they were concerned. I mean, what ifs? All the what ifs. And he just simply says, hey, this is what we know from the Lord. 
And we've got, again, everything we do is by faith. I watched every one of you sit down in a chair today, and your faith was such that the chair would hold you up. Okay? I saw people take their cups and fill them up with coffee with the faith that the coffee would stay in the cup or the cup would hold the coffee. All right? Everybody in the front row has faith that when I drink my coffee, I won't choke and spit it on them. <laughs> That's that great faith. Back there. <laughs> Those are the ones that have previously sat in the front. <laughs> They've learned from experience. Okay, I got a question. All right. The Day of Judgment, okay, is uh, a different day, and we're going to be discussing that probably next week. But you'll find that we talk about the Day of Judgment starting in Chapter 5, all right? The Day of Judgment is not the, the rapture, all right? So that's a good question. And the sequencing of all of this uh, is always up for debate. There's, uh, there's, let me tell you what, everybody since when Jesus ascended into heaven has been thinking about his return when he's coming back it's immediate in that sense and they're trying to figure out oh what well, another thing that was taking place too is uh, Duane they were experiencing these Christians in Thessalonica were experiencing persecution for their for their belief and, and there was this thought in their mind that maybe they had missed the rapture and that they were already into the period of tribulation and so the Apostle Paul, instead, again, instead of becoming a theologian, he said, hey, don't worry about it, okay? The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we'll meet them along with Jesus in the air, and we'll go to where God wants us to be. And the day of the Lord is, is something different, okay? And it comes at a later date, as far as my understanding. And we kind of get into that. He breaks it down into two parts. He breaks down just this aspect and does reassuring to those that he's ministering. Remember that Paul, Silas, and Timothy are the ones who planted the church there at Thessalonica, and they were still, they were still, um, they were still pastoring, uh, even, even through the the letter here and so forth. He didn't want them to be ignorant. He said, "Don't be ignorant. Don't be uninformed or lack knowledge." Um, He's actually writing to give them information concerning the rapture, isn't he? And it, it actually gives us in information as well. And we need to make a conscious choice to reject any, any statement or anything that would somehow deny the truth of the fact that Jesus Christ is going to return. Again, every time we have communion... Um, we do this in remembrance him uh, in the sense of the fact that he sacrificed his life for us and because of that we can have a right relationship with God and because of that right relationship with God we look forward to his return. We, we've learned and I'll make this statement this is not a very good world is it? Anybody disagree with that statement? This is a world in where <coughs> people have free will and they choose to be disobedient to God's word in their free will. And when you're disobedient to God's will, by using your free will to choose something other than his will, then we call that evil. You look around, because people disobey God, there's a lot of evil in this world. There was, um, we were praying for our brother this past week, and uh, I asked Dan to help me pray. And what was the Lord's you asked the Lord a specific question for this brother. What was his answer to you? What was God's answer to you? I asked the Lord, what is your will? And he said, to do my will. The Lord said, if you ask the Lord, what is your will? And the Lord's simply going to say, my will is for you to do my will. Uh, <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Duh. Yeah. So the Lord's will is simply that you use your free will to choose to be obedient. And when you're obedient, then you have fruit of obedience. And fruit of obedience is constructive, it's not counterproductive, and it will help lead you to eternal life. When, when I do the will of God, I'm blessed by it. 
I'm built up by it. Others are built up by it too. And it doesn't cause division. It doesn't cause harm. When I somehow get off of that will and I start into disobedience, well, that's where things get screwed up. That's, and even after having accepted Jesus Christ, that's my conversion experience, I'm still in the process of having to choose his will. There's never a point in my existence where God does want me to choose his will. And as a Christian, I don't get to just come to know him and say, okay, well, now I'm out there. I can do anything I want. No, I need, I'm called to do his will. And in doing his will, I become then more like Christ. And if we could all become more like Christ, I think, number one, our individual lives would be better. But number two, collectively as a fellowship, we would be better. And number three, we would be able to be a better witness to those that we come into contact with if we're more Christ-like. Um, so they had a dilemma. They, they weren't really sure. They listened to all these various you know, philosophies that were floating around. I mean, we're talking about being in, in Rome and Greek mythologies and you know, all the various things that were going on, and they were, trying, they were being affected to some degree by those, and the Apostle Paul just steps in and says, hey, don't worry about it. God's got this one. Their death, the, the death was the dilemma and was despair concerning them which were asleep. They loved those individuals. And, um, and basically the Apostle Paul says, look, when Jesus comes back, they're going to rise before you do to meet him in the air. And the, then everybody, all the Christians that are in him at that point in time will meet him in the air and will go to heaven, basically. Um, he also pointed out a despair a despair was simply that uh, they were becoming like those that didn't have God in their lives they were becoming like those that didn't have Christ in their life they were uh, kind of in that sense without hope okay if it's God just tell them to hold on I'm teaching <laughs> I know. <laughs> somebody, somebody read Psalms one sixteen, chapter one hundred and sixteen, verse fifteen. One more time. Psalms one sixteen, verse fifteen. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And then Titus um, 2.13. Titus 2.13. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. Okay, and then I think the King James is looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we do have a hope. And then the doctrine basically is simply, uh, he explains it, that if, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Christ or in Jesus will God bring with him. And so the, the statement here is that because we know that Jesus rose, and, of course, that's a historical fact. Then we can, based on just the historicity of that fact, know that we, too, will rise. And, of course, the Apostle Paul says that if we, if we discount the resurrection or if we say that Jesus didn't arise, well, then basically none of us should really be here. Because he, he simply says, Let's, uh, if there is no resurrection, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. For tomorrow we die. Now, I read kind of an analogy. It's, it's kind of like um, we're kind of like students, and, and we're in a class. And we should always be preparing. Uh, and when we get to that first day of class, the teacher gives us a syllabus. And, and someplace in that syllabus and in the period of the course of the semester, 
the teacher says you'll get a midterm test. And in that sense, we know there's a test, and we should be preparing for that test. We should, we should be living, and we should be in great expectation of that test. In this sense, the Lord's coming back. He's kind of like that midterm. He's coming back. We should be expecting it, but we shouldn't be just sitting around waiting for the 14th or 15th hour or, or whatever, um, doing nothing. I, oh, I always had college friends that waited to the very last moment. I know I'm not talking about any of you. Waited to the very last moment to do a cram test, okay? And, and to wait to the very last minute. And uh, no, Jesus is coming back. Just as sure as you're going to get a midterm, Jesus is coming back. And through that whole semester, you're to be preparing for his return. And you're to be looking forward to it as well. Uh, and so one of these days, we're going to go meet Jesus in the air. Now, if we, if we don't meet him in the air, well, then he'll take my breath away first, and I'll, be, I'll actually rise before those that are living. I'll actually rise before them. And, of course, I get into the theological aspects that if you live in Colorado, you have a mile head start. You have an hour head start, too. Because, you see, if he, if he, if he comes back, and, and globally speaking, the people, the Christians in, on Eastern time gets a two-hour head start, but they're at sea level. So, you know, the air's not as thin the there. Not as thin so there. Yeah. yeah. So exactly. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so we're, we're in a great spot, folks. We're at a mile high. Well, look at Tom. He's up there at the lake trying to walk on the water. He's going to be waiting for him. That's it. <laughs> He's already practicing. He's like, he's practicing. I'll get this down sooner or later. <laughs> you got about three quarters of a step. Yeah. But you try. Now, I found out if there's only pads to step on, they help a little bit. <laughs> the lily pads. Uh, he says, for, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. He, Dwayne, he's not doing this. Well, I believe. I love it when somebody says, well, I believe. Mm -hmm. well, what you should believe is what is written. Now, what was written or what we have that is written wasn't written at that particular point in time. And so he says a little bit different. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Amen. That, which, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Paul's authority, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. I, I've, had, I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, the, God has given me a word for you. <laughs> I kind of shiver and shake sometimes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I receive that word, but then I always verify it whether or not it's biblically correct or not. Because sometimes people are exuberant, sometimes they mean good, but sometimes it's not really a word from the Lord, it's a word from them. <laughs> Linda, you smiled. <laughs> it's not, it looks like maybe that, that might have happened sometime, or at least you're relating to what I'm saying. Okay. So I've met individuals in my life that, and how do you decipher without being, without judging? Situations like, you know, God told me this is what I need to do. Um, and in my mind, it sounds, I, I question how. How am I to know that this is what God wants mm -hmm. you to do? And it's not just the desire of your heart. From and I don't want to mention any names, but you'll know what I'm. You'll know who I'm talking about yeah. when I give this scenario. Um, I want to buy a trailer and go and preach all around the country. Yeah. And I need to buy this truck. This is what God wanted me. How do you know, how can you decipher without being a hypocritical judge as to what the truth is? Well, 
here's here, the first thing is that you don't need a trailer to go around and preach the gospel. Okay, it can start right here. It starts right now. All right. Um, there can be a dream. For example, I have a dream. All right. But I'm not waiting for that dream to be fulfilled for me to start working. Right. And yeah, I've I've dealt you know, with I'm this. No, but but it's a good example. It's really a good one, example. One is that? Example, but I've, I've met a few people like that that just you know this this is what I was told I need to do. Right. And and, if, and you if, you if, if if they were you told know. if they were told by the Lord, well then. I would work with that. I think that you need to start right here. Okay, I think you need to start right now. Um, well, I feel the Lord has called me to be a pastor. Well, the pastor is pastoring sheep. Take every opportunity right now. Now, where I really get skeptical is when somebody comes to me and says, the word of the Lord has told me to tell you this. Okay. And that definitely has to be biblical. And you'll be able to... Receive it with love and kindness, but then see if it's biblical. So you got to do a little research. Sometimes you'll know right away, no, that's not biblical. You know, um, so, something like that just happened with my brother Eric. Uh, Karen had uh, her pregnancy happen while she was in class. And right. They called her to look at her and take her home, and she went home and went back. He went to the, he was going to the store. He was standing in line, and there was some. Uh, there was a man standing in this other lane, and the man kept looking at Eric and, and like smiling at him, and smiling. And Eric's like, you know, hello, how you doing? And he's like, God just told me to pray for you. He said, you know, uh, told me that you need prayer. And he just told me to pray for you. And Eric says, well, I I'm okay, but you know, you pray for my wife. And, and you know, I don't have. I, I think if look at I've, I've been it looking good. And the Lord says, "Go speak with that family. I get up and say, you yeah. know, I'm Pastor Gary. I've never met you guys, but I just feel impressed to come over. And is there anything I can do for you? Do Do you need prayer? Is everything okay? I start asking questions like that and sometimes people will say no everything's okay but yeah. and then I can help focus on that whatever the but is about okay and so we've got kind of two different things going on here one where the Lord impresses you to go pray for somebody or maybe even share if, if the Lord does ask you to share a word for that person just make sure it's biblical okay make sure it's biblical a lot of times I'll, I'll start out and says um, you know, I, I feel really led to pray for you. I, I'm not really sure what it's about, but, you know, is there something I can help you with? Okay, do you have a need? Or do we need to pray about something specifically? Um, every now and then, in, in a, a, matter, a manner of having fun, I'll catch somebody by a window and I'll say, the Lord says, go to Africa. <laughs> I really don't think that was the Lord. <laughs> to be honest with you, I think that was just me having fun, okay? Just me having fun. So I know people say, well, I'm waiting on the Lord. Well, I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm going to take my trailer. I'm going to, the God, God's going to give me a, I'm going to be a pastor somewhere. Well, I, I'm not saying that that's not true. What I am saying that that starts now. That starts now. And I also know that... Put the work into it instead of put, just thinking... It's that's, that's right. Yeah. Okay, well, I know that fence. I know the Lord wants me to build that fence. Yeah. Well, well, the <laughs> fence never gets built unless you go get the lumber. Okay? What's that? Actions speak louder than words. Action speaks louder than words. Well, Dwayne.
Right. We can't. I mean, that's that's a good that's a good thought in the sense we can't forego the opportunities we have at hand just because we have our hope set on something in the future. And you know, first of all, it's good to have a goal. It's good to have an objective. But we got to be busy about the Lord's work. Now, look at my my goal is to be going up with the Lord. But that doesn't mean, and, and the admonishment by Paul was, well, let's get to work. Now, let's get to work. Let's take advantage, or let's participate in the opportunities we have now. And, and I had somebody says, well, I sure wish there was some, some place I could minister. You don't want to ask me that question. <laughs> Trust me. Okay, if you really want to minister, if you want to be blessed by God, and you're serious, I'll take you to any hospital today. I'll take you to the ICU waiting room. And I'll guarantee you there'll be opportunity to minister. All right? If you really want to minister today, right there. There's not a person over there that wouldn't want a smiling face saying God loves you. And I mean, I can go on and on and on. But we'll see how serious people really are when they, when they say that. Now, the word judge, um, and, and this is a little bit off the subject here, but I, I want to deal with this. The word judge really kind of sets, sets my, uh, it kind of gets me excited in this sense, that we're to judge ourselves so that we, uh, we don't have to be condemned. Okay, and I don't have that scripture in hand right now. But we're to, we're to take and do our own self-inventory. Okay? When, when I share the word with you, I don't judge you. I may, you may, I may share certain scriptures with you to show you in and and, and a confrontation. Here, the confrontation is not meant to somehow judge you, but to bring truth to light so that you can be, take advantage of that truth or participate in the truth. And sometimes I have a very good way of making sure that I make it my priority as a pastor to bring that truth to light in your life especially if I see something that's going on where you're not being obedient to the word and therefore it's going to be counterproductive and destructive. I don't want the sheep to be hurt. And so I'm willing to confront with the word of God. And the word of God never speaks against the individual, but speaks against the action or the behavior of the individual. And so if you're speaking against the individual, well, then you're judging. If you're speaking against and you're using the word of God to somehow correct the behavior, well, then you're just doing what you're supposed to be doing, sharing the word of God, helping a brother or sister, right? So it's kind of your intent. And, and the Lord shared something with me just the other day. In John chapter 3, verse 17, I, I think it's actually verse 18. It says, uh, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but the world condemns itself because they've rejected me. If you've rejected God, you're, you're already judged. You're, you, may be, you, just haven't met, you just haven't got to where you get your sentence. You're already guilty. You're dead in your transgressions and sins. You're already judged. You're dead. You're at that moment, you're dead. Because At you're that already, moment, yeah. you're alive on yeah. earth, but spiritually, you're dead. You're already judged. But you always have the opportunity to, to re-give your heart to you, so it's not, a, it's not like a death sentence right yeah. there eternally until you're actually dead. Right. You know, now, with... I, I mean, I'm, I was, I've been interested in, in, in that, now that you mentioned it. Okay, because you know that when I was in prison in 2007 and my mother passed away, that I blamed God. And I rejected God. And I became agnostic. And now, and now I've, I've re-given my life back to God. So you're saying that is my spirit dead since I rejected God? Or what I'm saying is that... still alive because I have Christ in my life. Now? The spirit's alive because you have Christ in your life and you're being obedient. Okay. So there's a scripture, and I, I don't remember where it's at. I'm sorry. But it talks about judging yourself so that you won't be condemned. 
Now, if, if, if you judge yourself, like in this case, you, you judged God. You put God on, on trial. You blamed him. Yeah. Spiritually, you were dead. Spiritually, you were dead. But you still, like Tom says, you're still not dead physically, so you still have opportunity. You still, you, we only get one chance. It says as long as you have bread in your body. That's right. And, and you've heard me preach that when I go into an ICU room and I hear the beep, beep, we still have hope. There's always hope. Now, there's hope that that person will be resuscitated to the point that they can uh, live again a good life. But at least if they don't know the Lord, to be brought back to consciousness so that we can share gospel with them and hopefully they'll accept Christ at that moment in time. So there's hope. Beep, beep, beep. So at the point in time in which you just curse God and you walk away from him, you're spiritually dead. You know, I was there at that point too, Louise. My little sister passed away when I was 13 years ago, 12, 13 years ago. And, you know, I was angry and blamed everybody I could blame, including God. I was mad, angry, you know, but as far as I know, there's nothing here that says you cannot be angry with God. You know, just just because you're angry and you don't understand doesn't mean that your what's in your heart has faded. Yeah, don't turn from God. We may not understand everything, okay? But if we turn from God, we can't communicate with God, and we can't somehow understand everything at the end. Uh, so when, when it comes to judging, and, and when I'm sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, people will say, you're judging. And I, I, I wish, basically, people that had microphones bigger than this one, that had an audience, would say, no. If you haven't accepted Jesus, then you're already judged. I'm just giving you the word. This is a confrontation to give you the word to eliminate the truth so that you can come basically to the truth and the truth can set you free so now if you get mad at me that's your choice you can get mad at me all I'm tempting to do is to give you the truth and if you don't want the truth to set you free that's on you what's on me is I have to do what the Lord tells me to do and that's to plant seed I'm the messenger you can choose to receive the message or reject it kids as an example you know we we raised our kids I, I know other people that have raised their kids with God in their life and you know, you know like with Maria singing in the choir and then they grow up and then they get to be teenagers and then they get influenced and they get all these other things in their life you know but my belief is that raise them up with God in their life eventually they are going to return to God. Amen. They, they have to. You know, it, it's a circle and, and, and our, our point, our purpose is to start that circle off in the right direction for right. them. Right, right. And the foundation that they need to, to continue their life. I've got proof of it. My daughter Nikki, you know, they brought her to church all the time, religiously, you know, and look at her now. To a good church, a good Christian based church. Not only is she going there and, and leaving and, and doing right with, you know, by her kids, her husband, my niece, Kristen, they've all given their hearts to God. Praise God. You know, and, the church, and it, it's an amazing thing. And it started off with my wife bringing Nicole as a little girl to church. Right. She instilled that in them, and they returned to it. And hopefully someday, when their kids go through the, the change of life and have kids and see the importance and how crazy the world is, when that happens, that they're going to return to God. Amen. They had the foundation. And that's the prayer of us as parents. Why would we want something bad for our children? The best thing is they have a relationship with God, and they allow that relationship to affect the way they live, because that's the best Okay. We're not saying that we live in the best world. What we're saying 
and we've talked about this, we live in the best way to get to the best world. Okay, yes? Well, and also we uh, have more that pulls us away from God. There is just so much that pulls you far away from God. That's when he was saying, you can return. Oh, yeah, but you have free will. away from him constantly. We, we have free will. All right. The closer you get, the, the harder the pull. The, the, the choice is ours on how far we get pulled. You know, and that goes back to the, the kids. You know, there's a breaking point. There, there's a limit. There, there's a point in your life to where you actually have to say, enough is enough. I'm done. Help me. That's surrender. Take me away. That's what it is. Yeah. That's surrender. Like that commercial, yeah. Calgon, take me away. Lord, please just, <laughs> you know, jump in and rescue me. I need it. I got a Calgon cock. <laughs> and, and, cool. and that comes in many, 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 many aspects, many, many forms. You know, my my God moment was my daughter and my wife. Mm. You know, you could go right own, back to that moment in time, my can't you? Vice and, and, and cops and robbers and all that stuff. And my daughter and my wife literally saved my life, and that was God working through them to get to me. There you go. And, and I'll never forget it. I'll yeah. never forget it. You know, yeah. My wife told me flat out, you know, enough is enough. We're not doing this no more. You get your group together or things are changing. Yeah, and she loves, to, she loves to live with little Jesus, but she didn't like to live with little Tom. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't. No. no, because the more you become like Christ, the better it gets. Amen. And, and that's where I'm saying, you know, there, there comes a point in time in your life where you just got to know that enough is enough. And Lord knows I'm not the perfect individual. I'll be the first to admit it. My wife will be the second. But me versus 10 years ago, there's not even a comparison. And there's not even a desire to go back. It's, it's a choice that you make. Uh, and and I, I can guarantee you this. Um, you've come a long ways in five years, too. We all have, haven't we? A long ways in five years. And Lord, give us another five years. We'll be on further down the road than we are today in becoming more Christ-like. And if for whatever reason one of us should die, we don't have to worry about that person because if they're in Christ, they're going to be resurrected just as we're going to meet them in the air and then we're going to party for the eternity, okay? And, and basically, we're just going to experience God's 701K plan for us. That, Yes? I want to go first. You want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> that means I'll be last. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> it, 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 does, it doesn't matter. It, just, it, it came into my head, I got to say you know, change. God wants us to change. That's right. You know? And He's not saying change everything right now, today, this instant. Change is change. Yeah. You know, as long as you change, little little baby steps. Give me something to hang my hat on. Yeah. Baby steps. Yeah. Change is change is what counts. I I, I got a Washington. This guy right back here. His hand's going like this, man. <laughs> yeah. Stretching. You're stretching. <laughs> I need a little work on this shoulder. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got something. Okay. Uh, I have the opportunity to meet a lot of people. Speak, speak up real loud I have back the there. I to speak with a lot of people in my new restaurant. Okay. Recently, I've met a couple of people who have taken on this philosophy of there are many rows of people inside of my heart. Two days ago. It's just so. <laughs> they don't have an answer for any of those roads, do they? So they, can, so they want to put everything into a box which is snug and cold. And there's no accountability. It's self reasoning. And I had a conversation with one of them about the last night. It's just amazing how it's just circular reasoning. It's a good plan. That's going to be a good conversation. There's no justification. Everything is okay. But they'd rather believe that where there's no basis than they would the word of God where there is basis, okay? 
And, and so that's why the Apostle Paul, just getting back to our study here, it says, For we say this unto you by the word of the Lord. In other words, he's bringing, this is not my philosophy. This is not the philosophy of the Greeks and the mythologies that you can understand, you know, of this day and age. This is, this is not religious mumbo-jumbo, but this is the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord simply says, don't worry about it. Okay, I'm comforting you now. Yeah, you have a lot of concerns, but let me tell you what. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then we're going to join. Those of that are alive in Christ are going to join. Now, he wasn't talking about Old Testament saints. He wasn't talking about any of that, all right? He was just talking about those that are dead in Christ. So I'm not going to take this one scripture and spread it backward as well as forward from to the very... Genesis chapter 1 all the way through Revelation. All right? And that's why we're not going to be theologically exploring this one portion of Scripture. He was just trying to comfort the people who, who don't have, who didn't have a written Bible. Now, we can go through this whole thing and find even more comfort than just that one verse. Okay, even more comfort. One thing I've, I've been reading the Bible that's Last good. Weeks. And I've been reading about a lot of suffering and bickering about how in the Old, Old Testament how they prayed for praying for relief or help or sign. But they sent Jesus and Jesus paid for their sins and our sin. But still today we still cry for complain and want to sign. I, I don't gripe or complain. I mean, I mean the net. The <laughs> yeah, you don't. <laughs> it's not out loud. In the Old Testament, it was only God, not Jesus. Yeah. God the Creator. Yeah. He revealed Himself only as God the Creator, and judgment yeah. came swiftly. And we won't discuss that because it's not being a theologian. This is just comforting. <laughs> I am so tempted because <laughs> I love to be the theologian. <laughs> if, you ever, if you ever really want to experience something and you see how we really um, digest and tear apart this and tear apart that and discuss it from various angles, come and just sit in one Thursday with us. I've got Dwayne's in on it and Sean's in on it and Jill's husband's in on it. <laughs> I, I had to do that one. <laughs> Dan's in on it. And, and let me tell you, Louise is in on it. Now, what's up with that? Oh. That other guy. Louis Manfredi is in on it. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, <laughs> the old man. Yeah, right. Telling people to have all that extra time. All the extra yeah. time. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so, here he's comforting his readers who are confused. Back to the Word of God. If you're confused, just go to the Word of God. He'll help getting you straightened out real fast. Seek a brother that, or a sister that will, will sit down with you with the Word of God and really, really endeavor to... Um, to find out what the Word of God says. Now, I want to be cautious with this statement. Just because we have church doctrine doesn't mean it's the Word of God. All right? Well, by God, I did it this way, and I want to, you know, I, no. We need to make sure that it's the Word of God. And when you know the truth, what will the truth do? Set you free. Set you free. Man, this hour just goes way too fast goes way too fast. Sherry, could you dismiss us in prayer? Yes, you could. Oh, yeah, we're going to develop everybody, and this is part of our development. Praise God. Today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Amen. Bless everybody here today. Help them find peace in the world. Your Lord bless us, and we thank you for the good, the bad, and everything that exists. Amen. Amen. Uh, have fellowship uh, at 10.30. We'll start our praise and worship.